Hello, Psych 101 students. Welcome to Module 7, Chapter 14, Learning Objective 5. We will look at eating disorders and disorders affecting children. So let's begin with eating disorders. Eating and eating disorders are one of the 19 DSM-5 categories. Body image refers to how people perceive their physical selves. Uh, chronic dieting may promote the development of a clinical eating disorder. These disorders typically begin in adolescence, peaking peak in emerging adulthood, once again, that's 18 to 25, and then decline during midlife and after. Eating disorders are about four times more likely in women than for men. Um, anorexia nervosa, um, individuals, this is, refers to individuals with an excessive fear of becoming fat. Those with anorexia have a distorted body image, perceiving, perceiving themselves to be much larger than they are in reality. In fact, I mean, they will never, they never reach a point of believing that they are thin enough because of their distorted body image. So it's not like there's a goal that they're striving towards that they can possibly meet. I mean, they can be, you know, um, extremely thin, like sickly thin, and they still feel, they will still see imperfections where they need to lose more weight or, or become even thinner. And so there, this is, you know, the, the crux of the disorder that it, it is, it is constant and, and relent, relentless pursuit of, of, to become thinner and thinner. Uh, it mainly affects upper middle class and upper class white girls. Uh, fewer than one in a hundred meet the clinical criteria of anorexia nervosa as described by the DSM-5. So less than 1% of, of people get this, get this disorder. It causes a number of serious health problems, particularly heart disease and a loss of bone density. And it has a high mortality rate. So a lot of people do die from anorexia. This, these pictures here show you know, one person, an example, one person that did recover. Um, so this is, uh, this was Lauren Bailey. Uh, she used to walk more than 30 miles a day as part of her, her obsessive weight loss regime. It helped her to lose 42 pounds, um, but she successfully recovered and is now fit and well. Uh, but once again, many people do not recover. Um, they basically, you know, they're starving themselves to death. Uh, bule bulimia nervosa. Uh, people with that with this disorder alternate between dieting, binge eating, and then compensating behaviors such as purging. Um, <clears throat> when people hear about purging, you know, the most common form that people think of is 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 vomiting after the eating that that's certainly one popular form of purging so you binge eat and then you throw up to to get rid of the food but the, there are other purging is any kind of extreme behavior to to lose to lose you know the 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 weight quickly or to lose calories quickly that you've just eaten through your binge eating. So it could include laxatives or diet pills or even excessive exercise would be could is one form of purging. But the purging, you know, it, it's all the purging behavior, whatever it is, always follows, you know, a, a binge eating episode. Uh, approximately one to two percent of women in high school and college meet the criteria for bulimia nervosa. Uh, they tend to be average weight or slightly overweight. So you they're harder to detect just, you know, um, just by observation than somebody with anorexia. I mean, just to go back, I mean, you know, when a, an, an, when an anorexia 
an anorexic will progress to a point where it's obvious that that they've lost too much weight and they're um, um, because they they just keep losing weight. So, with somebody with bulimia, I mean, because they're they're you know they're binge eating and they're purging, but but it it tends to kind of balance out. So so they 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 don't really lose weight. They just kind of maintain their they tend to maintain their current weight. Um, people, so because it's harder to detect, detect people will sometimes go years, you know, can, they can go years without people realizing, um, they tend to do all these behaviors in private, their purging behaviors or, and, and, and often their, their binge eating behaviors are, are done privately. And, and so they often, you know, it's often something that, that they keep well hidden. Um, for both women and men, bulimia is more common than anorexia nervosa. However, most people with bulimia are women. Um, okay. And, and certainly, you know, anorexics are, are, are much, way more uh, women than, than men. So both, both of these eating disorders tend to affect women than, women more than men. Um, but then we have binge eating disorder, and this one actually affects men more. This is when people engage in binge eating at least once a week, once a week, but they do not purge. So this is what differentiates it. This is a new disorder. It was just added in the DSM-5 for the first time. Um, so it's the binging without the purging. Um, these people often eat very quickly, even when they're not hungry, and they often experience feelings of guilt and embarrassment. Uh, many people with binge eating disorder are affected by obesity, um, and it's more common, once again, among men. Um, this, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not a, there are lots of people that will binge at times, and, and it's not necessarily a disorder. Once This is one of those um, conditions where it's only a disorder when it's really bothering the person. It's like, and this is, you know, especially this part that mentions that they have feelings of guilt and embarrassment. So, so they, this, which, which shows that they, you know, they don't like their behavior. Um, and, and, you know, they, but they just feel like they can't stop at times. So this is not just a typical person overeating and becoming fat. There's lots of, there's lots of us in, in, in the U S and, uh, but it's when like, you know, when you when it's really bothering you so it's, it's a person the, it's almost like the person themselves decide if it's a disorder it's like they seek help for it like i just can't quit and but i want to um the binge eating once again it, it's uh mainly done in private um oops yeah this is just a chart highlighting the the three eating disorders and going through the criteria for each of them. I'm not going to go through it, but it's a nice summary. It's on page 581. Um, neurodevelopmental disorders are a group of disorders that affect the development of the nervous system, leading to abnormal brain function, which may affect emotions, learning ability, self-control, and memory. All the neural developmental disorders should be considered within the context of, of normal childhood development because some of the symptoms are just extremes of normal behavior or they're normal behaviors for much younger children. So, so uh, you know, a prime example is, is ADHD. I mean, you know, inattentiveness and hyperactivity. These things are very normal for, for let's say, um, a preschool age child. I mean, this it, they those conditions, those um, symptoms kind of uh, define define preschoolers. They're very inattentive and they're very hyperactive and. Um, so when somebody 
Uh, so, you know, being hyperactive or inattentive, those are not unusual behaviors, but they're unusual, you know, to show them at, at a preschool level, like if you're a, a seven or eight year old, you know, let's say instead of a, a three or four year old. So, so some of these, you know, and, and this is why they, they talk about, you know, uh, um, that, that these disorders should be considered with, within the context of normal childhood development because, off, you know, like I was saying, many times they are normal behaviors or they're just extremes of, of normal behaviors. They're not like brand new symptoms that that a normal person would never experience. They're just experiencing them to a greater extent or at a later age than they should be. Uh, this category includes a wide range of disorders. Um, there are six types of neural neurodevelopmental disorders that affect children shown in this chart on page 583. Uh, make sure you read this chart and, and understand the disorders. Uh, I'm once again, I'm not going through all of these, but we will just we're going to cover two of them, and and we're going to go through autism spectrum disorder and ADHD attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Let's begin with autism spectrum disorder. It's a developmental disorder characterized by deficits in social interaction, by impaired communication, and by restrictive, restricted repetitive behaviors and interests. It affects approximately one to two percent of children um, that show signs of autism spectrum disorder, and males with the disorder outnumber females five to one. Uh, just to go back to the title for a second, Autism Spectrum Disorder. Uh, uh, you know, it, the word spectrum just means that there is a wide range of severity that exists in this, in this category of disorders. Um, as it says down below here, Autism Spectrum Disorder varies in severity from, from being mild social impairments to severe social and intellectual impairments. So when you see the word spectrum, um, this is what it, it always implies. There's, there's, a, there's a wide range of, of severity levels. Um, okay, from 1991 to 1997, there was a dramatic increase of 556% in the number of children diagnosed with autism. Um, because of this extreme dramatic increase, there were a lot of theories put forth about what caused this sudden increase in autism. And one of the um, theories that, that made, that really kind of made a splash in the media and, and got a lot of people worried was that they were being, that the increase was due to, um, due to vaccines. And that, you know, either that there was some, some of the newer vaccines might be causing autism or some of the common or is a combination of vaccines. Uh, but really what explains this increase the most was, was that they, they started to use more liberal diagnostic criteria, meaning that they expanded the criteria for who would belong to this category. So a lot of people that wouldn't have been diagnosed with autism, you know, in earlier years were all of a sudden being diagnosed because of the expanded criteria. Also, they they we, there were methods developed to detect autism earlier. So this also led to an increase of autism of, of the autism numbers because they started to identify children at an earlier age. And so, like, it just, it was really just more about who classified to have autism versus who didn't. And, and this was the major change that occurred. So all of a sudden, there was a huge expansion of the number of people that classified as having the disorder. And this caused the increase. Um, okay. Okay. Um, a very severe case, so I told you it's a spectrum, a severe case, when you have a severe case of autism spectrum disorder, it is known as autistic disorder. So that, that represents 
that you you have a severe case. Uh, somebody with autistic disorder has severe deficits in language, social bonding, and imagination. Uh, it's often accompanied by intellectual impairment. So we have pro big problems with language, big problems with bonding with others, you know, with so social interaction, big problem with a lack of imagination. And once again, intellectual impairments often there as well. Um, high functioning autism is sometimes called Asperger's syndrome. So it's a less severe form of autism. It's kind of at the other, other end of, of the spectrum. Those with Asperger's syndrome can often function effectively in school or in occupational settings um, and tend to, you know, just have, and they tend to have more minor issues. Um, okay, symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. Uh, children with a severe form of autism spectrum disorder are seemingly unaware of others. They fail to respond to efforts to gain their attention. You could be yelling, you know, you know, if the uh, let's say the kid's name is Johnny, whatever, like Johnny, Johnny over here, Johnny, and and they it'll be like they just don't hear you. Like they they're hearing fine, but they they don't they won't look up. They're not responding to their name. They they're not responding to you calling them or yelling at them. Like it's it's really hard to to grab their attention. You you often have to physically you know go in and 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 kind of you know and physically touch them and. If you want them to, to get up or to do something, it's like they're they're off in their own world, and this is this is really what you see with severe autism. It just um, no no real social contact, or you know, um, just doing their own thing all the time. Um, deficits in communication are another characteristic of autism spectrum disorder. In severe cases, it can be completely completely lacking. So in some severe cases, they will not develop any language. Um, in less severe cases like Asperger's, it's often more just um, some quirky behaviors, social behaviors. Uh, my ex-wife's brother has, has, has Asperger's and, you know, he would, I would, when I spoke to him, like he would always avoid eye contact, for instance. So, you know, it was just it was just kind of quirky. I mean, otherwise, you know, he he certainly could carry on a conversation. He he was functional. He ended up having a family. He ran a business for a little while. But but you talked to him, he he would always be looking off to the side of my head, and you know, so it's a little distract. It was a little distracting at times to have a conversation with him because I'd be looking at his face, and he'd always be looking off to, you know, pass the side of my head, but. But once again, more kind of quirkiness in, in a in a less severe case. So once again, a wide range. Um, another set of deficits includes restrictive, repetitive behaviors and interests. So somebody with autism may become an expert in one area of interest, um, you know, because they just. Um, they just may they may just become really fascinated with one thing and constantly be watching programs about it and reading about it and, and playing with toys after with it. So like you know, a kid with autism might become a dinosaur expert and be able to name every dinosaur and and have facts about them memorized and things like that um, because they they often have these very narrow interests. Um, any changes in daily routine or in the placement of furniture or toys are very upsetting for children with autism spectrum disorder. They really like routine. They like things to stay the same. Um, when things do get changed or when the routine gets disrupted, they may throw violent, uh, violent temper tantrum. Um, and this sometimes can be uh, can be dangerous or harmful to the to the child. Uh, okay, their behavior also tends to be repetitive. Can include strange hand movements, body rocking, and hand flapping. Self injury is common, especially when they throw a, a, a temper tantrum. 
and some children must be forcibly restrained to keep them from hurting themselves. Um, just an example of a couple of studies that were, were done. Um, in the in the first two pictures on the left here, they they examined um, uh, videotapes of, of very young children's birthday parties and and you could see evidence of of autism like you know when these uh you know during during these these infant birthday parties um when you look back at the film um the child um on the left um who was later diagnosed with autism uh when you when they look back at the video he was very focused on objects more than people. And so even in his earliest behaviors, as during these, you know, during his infancy, he was he was very fascinated with objects and looking at them and not really clicking or responding to people as much. The child uh on the right, you know, this is a in the control condition, you know, this is somebody that wasn't diagnosed and 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 when you look at the baby pictures, they were responding to people talking to them, they would, he would, you know, here is a picture, he's look, actually looking up at a person here. Um, and so they, this was just a, a study showing that you could already, you know, when you look back, you could, you could see the telltale signs of autism, you know, at these, at these, um, in, if, you know, one year birthday parties. Um, in the second study over here uh, on the right, it, it was a 1994 study, and what they were using some eye tracking equipment, um, and eye tracking equipment is really cool. I mean, it, it pinpoints exactly what a person is looking at, like you can see exactly where they're looking. Uh, for instance, on screen, so they were showing this this kid, this two year old with autism spectrum disorder, um, a Barney video, and you can see you know, where his focus was in this circled area over on the right. So, you know, during this party video, I mean, he's looking at some shelving over over on the right. I mean, like, and and not at the main characters that are that are talking and, and interacting and and this is typical. They this a uh, child with autism spectrum disorder often focuses on on more unimportant details in a scene rather than on social interactions that take place. Uh, development of autism spectrum disorder. It's, it's now well established that autism is the result of biological factors. Research into the causes of autism also points to prenatal and or early childhood events that may result in brain dysfunction. Uh, there's evidence that the brains of people with autism have faulty wiring to a large number of areas. And these areas have to do with social thinking and attention to social aspects of the environment. And so, you know, which makes sense. I mean, this is why they, you know, one of their main deficits is, is the lack of, of, res of response to social interactions and in in that they do not form bonds with people and they, you know, so, the faulty wiring is is in areas that have to do with social aspects and, and social thinking. And... and ADHD will be our final topic in this learning objective. The primary problems of ADHD include inattention, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. Um, Children must show symptoms before the age of 12 to be diagnosed with ADHD. In the United States, 7% of children have ADHD and is more common in boys than girls. It's about a three to one ratio of males to females um, that get diagnosed with autism. So three times as many boys as girls. Um, ADHD is related to numerous functional problems in both children and adults. The causes of ADHD are unknown, but there are you know, some indicators, environmental factors such as low birth weight, 
social disadvantage and, and adversity and exposure to lead and other toxic substances may contribute to the onset of symptoms. Um, but once again, it's, we, it's, it's still being researched. ADHD does have a strong genetic component. Um, they, they've noticed that the brains of those with ADHD develop more slowly than average, particularly in areas involving attention, cognition, motor control, emotional regulation, and motivation. And, uh, and this, this makes sense. I mean, this, those areas are what contribute to their problems. I mean, you know, inattention, so, you know, the area involving attention is um, develops lower than average, which causes their attention problems. Uh, motor control areas, so this was what can cause their hyperactivity. Um, um, and uh, uh, the, the motivation and emotional regulation areas um, can can certainly uh, be related to to their impulse control problems. Um, anyway, so so you know, there's still once again still a lot of ongoing research in this area to try to pinpoint you know more. Who's going to get eight issues? Who's not? And we, I mean, you know, once again, we know genetics are involved, but but there's all we they're, they're sure that there's environmental factors as well that contribute to it. Um, ADHD across the lifespan. I mean, um, it's usually first diagnosed between the ages of five and seven. Um, after formal schooling begins, is typically when it gets diagnosed because. It's, you know, before a child attends formal schooling, it's fine when they're, if they're, like I said, preschoolers, you know, they, they're they often hyperactive and inattentive and they, you know, it's part of being a preschooler. Uh, but when, when you start attending formal schooling, then that is when you are required to sit still and to listen to instructions and to pay attention. And this is why it typically gets, it doesn't typically, you know, get diagnosed until um, a child is put into that kind of environment where where there are demands on their behaviors. Uh, but with the development of more structured daycare settings, the demands on children to conform are occurring much earlier. Um, daycares, it used to be that only, you know, schools would start to identify those that might may have ADHD, you know, once the child started in the kindergarten and in grade one, but now with daycare settings, more and more daycare settings are are also um, asking children to conform and to sit still and to listen to instructions, and and so we are starting to identify it um, during the preschool years as well. Um, the DSM five recognizes that many of the symptoms of ADHD continue well into adulthood. So this is not a childhood disorder that you simply outgrow. Um, it, it can continue throughout the lifespan. Um, adults with ADHD symptoms compose about 4% of the population. Um, and they struggle, tends to cause struggles both academically and vocationally. Uh, so with school and with jobs. And that will conclude Learning Objective 5 and conclude Chapter 14.